Mass graves for an unprecedented crisis. A scene more like a Middle Eastern war zone or the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. But this is America. Hello. Today is a very special day because it's Pentecost, the celebration of Pentecost, which was when the Holy Spirit descended upon the church. And you can say it was the day the church was born. And uh, this day is a very special day for us in Atlanta because we are again starting the services in person. So we will be gathering together to celebrate this day of Pentecost after almost 11 weeks of being in quarantine and seeing us only through uh, the videos. So if you will this is as a birthday for the church and uh, we are very excited to be together again. Uh, the virus has robbed our Passover but we are recovering in Pentecost. And as I said, Pentecost was the birth of the church. 
And even though we now remember that joyful occasion, it was anything except joyful as they struggled in prayer in that upper room trying to make sense of everything that had happened that made their world go upside down with the death of their leader. The disciples and the followers of Jesus were thrust into a new normal. Everything changed and they were forced to adapt. At first they thought they knew what the new normal was and it seemed for a while, even for a couple of years maybe, that the new normal was a church in Jerusalem growing with the Jews. But soon they found out that God had other plans and they had no choice but to begin to adapt even against their, their instincts of what they thought they knew that Jesus had taught them. They had no choice but to adapt the incoming of the revelation of the Gentiles to the church through the ministry of Paul and his doctrines, which just totally shook up all their past ideas, pretensions of the Jewish-only church and an adaptation which was for some of them very, very hard. And so I believe it will be for us too in this time of rebirth of the world that is upon us. As I shared with you in the introduction, this situation with the virus is not really, as far as amount of impact of deaths in the world, it's not so far, far up the chart compared to other pandemics in world history. Like take the Black Plague that took 200 million. It's not that high a figure when you figure all the deaths in the world for many different causes. Now why did this small in comparison to past disasters, why has it brought such impact in the world? Such, such scare such fears that it shut down the economy, shut down business, shut down everything and brought terror into people's hearts. Who but God could create such panic, touch the hearts of man in such a way to be deeply moved, even the rich, along with the poor, sharing the same fate, sharing, sharing the same fears, God wrought terror in the hearts of men to bring forth these changes and usher in the next phase of his eternal plan. And now the world is going through a new rebirth and the church also. A change for the world and for the church. And we have no part in that change. We cannot affect it. We are forced into that changed. And we see this rebirth as equating to the analog analogy of the life, the human life. We as babies came into and uh, were birthed into this world. We're forced to change worlds. We didn't ask to be born. We were comfortable in our mother's womb. We didn't want to leave that nice, comfortable state where we had everything we needed. Our food was provided. The temperature was perfect. There wasn't much noise inside. It was just a, a utopia. And suddenly, we were forced into a new world, a strange world, in a painful transition from the old to the new that no doubt brought terror. No, oh, I can't remember it. But I'm sure if that baby could think, would say, what on earth is going on? A new normal. And it would spend years learning what that new normal was out about, all about and adapting to life and to that new normal. And so it will be for us, and especially that new generation that is being born into this new normal. The chaos of birth, to go from relative darkness to light as, as that babe has never seen such bright lights before. The pain of losing the comforts, of experiencing new things, noises, 
louder than ever has been heard before from the protection of the normal. The baby now encounters a new normal. And that baby will have to adapt as he is born into the new world. But not only a new coming generation will have to adapt, but so will the mother generation have to adapt. The church will have to adapt. And she will suffer. Perhaps in a different way. She was happy during nine months that a new generation would come. But now, living with this new generation brings its own complications. And as the mother adapts, even with all the love she has for her newborn child, as she adapts to the new normal, suffering comes and changes, and many times it's bad. There's something you probably heard is called PPD, postpartum depression, where the mother feels exhausted. I don't blame her. No sleep. Baby crying. All the attention. That postpartum depression makes her miserable, irritable, depressed, fearful, insomnia, anger, mood changes, anxiety, guilt, loss of pleasure in activities, mood swings, even panic attacked. And worst of all, an aloof, broken relationship with her husband. And it already has happened in the church in the past. I've seen many churches that have concentrated on the baby evangelism, increasing the size of their family. But the mother, which is the church, has abandoned the husband. Their love has grown cold. They have lost their first love as the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. And many a marriage has been brought to the brink because of the abandonment of the husband. In the crisis of pregnancy, he had all the attention. She was dependent upon his support, his strength, his covering, his safety of the husband. In fact, during the crisis of pregnancy, she needed him more than ever. And don't even talk about the midnight cravings. By the way, a word to pastors. Be careful to give to the church what they crave for, what they want to eat at this time, especially of change and of adaptation of what's going on around us. You know that the uh, Mayo Clinic says that pregnant women all uh, often crave weird non-food items like dirt, clay or, or paper and this is a likely sign of, of nutritional value they don't know why craving for strange things at midnight at two o'clock in the morning and the poor husband has to run out and get those special pickles she wants in the midst of the pregnancy the mother which is the church she needs a good diet to keep her healthy to keep her strong so pastors, beware of those cravings. Don't give mama what she wants. Give the church what it needs. The protein that comes from heaven. The manna that has everything she could ever want or ever need for her and for the children. You know, one of the biggest enemies is fear, apprehension. Questions will always plague us in the midst of change that we don't understand those what ifs. Jesus said, Jesus said we shouldn't be troubled with and not let our heart be troubled. Like the picture that said, worries won't take away tomorrow's problems. It will take away today's peace. And with all the questions that come about the possible outcomes as a mother imagines the possible scenarios of childbirth and panics will I survive will the church survive will my child survive is will he be sick will he be a bundle of joy 
or a bundle of problems. And even some are worried about whether they'll be able to get rid of their weight. Will I ever regain that nice body I had? What's the new baby going to be like? Ugly, beautiful, blonde, blue eyes, brown eyes. And as we see the birth process coming to a conclusion, the birth pangs, those convulsions in the world, as in the birthing of a child, that indicate change is being procured, as the world struggles to make sense of this new world that is being born. And as you've probably heard, we had big problems here in Atlanta with riots as many, many cities in the United States and in the world. It's just the symptoms of those spiritual contractions of the labor of birth of the new that God is bringing to the world. And that is an example of what's going on spiritually as God is moving, calling his people, calling this new generation. But you know, they're not all his people. There is a generation of evil that do not recognize God as a father. And their God is the devil. Jesus said in John 8, 44, Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he did not dwell in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks that of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And when you see so much lies, exaggerations. I love that picture that I put in the introduction. The virus with the big nose of Pinocho, the lies, the lies, the lies. Every time you hear this lie or half lie or exaggerated, you know who the father of that is and what his purposes is and the power that's behind those things. But there's also a people whose God is the Lord. The prodigal son came back to his father not to his friend's father's house, but to his father's house. Because his friends were sons of other fathers. But it wasn't his father. And yes, the prodigal son and his friends, when they were in the world frolicking, they were indistinguishable one from another until the crisis came. And then they parted and returned to their respective fathers. They never came. They never woke. They never said, I have to go to my father's house. No. Jesus said, it's the spirit that quickens. You know, the spirit is hovering over the earth, quickening those that have the mark that they are and belong to God's people. And God is marking them, awaking them. Not all, not everyone, because they're not all God's children. We don't know who they are, but the spirit that knows the heart, that know the origin of those spirits, they know who is their father. You might have heard the phrase, it's a slang, actually. It's an expression used to show dominance over somebody else in an aggressive way. And, and you might have heard it. It says, who's your daddy? Knows who has power over you. You know, there was some news this last week. A very popular uh, series on TV here before in the United States until very recently is called The Duck Dynasty. Dynasty. Everyone loved it. It's about the Robinson family with big beards, like a typical Southern family that just loves the outdoor li life. They're from Texas. They love hin hunting and fishing and, and uh, fried chicken and just enjoying old family life. 
But just recently, that God-fearing patriarch called Phil, who was converted when he was very young and married his wife, and his life changed 50 years ago, he just found out that he had a 45-year-old daughter he didn't know he had that was conceived in the times of his youth before he met God when he was living in sin. And the daughter wanted to know who she was seeking, who her family was. And so she did a DNA test looking for her father. And that DNA test revealed that she was the daughter of the very famous Robinson family and of the patriarch, Phil. And now, she's reunited. They received her with open arms. What a family, Christian family. They eat every week together in the Father's house. And now she's reunited along with her family and her children. So we all have a spiritual DNA. So I would ask, who is your daddy? If you are God's, he will call you. He will quicken you. No matter how far away you are, no matter who you think your daddy is, but he will quicken you by his spirit. If your father is God, the God of heaven, search him out. Return to your family because you will only be safe in his house. It is a win-win situation for his children to return to the safety of their father's house and the Father's arms. Every other option is lose-lose, the only option to win. So choose right. This is a time of the valley of decision. Now is the time to come to the house of the Father. It is well. With my soul It is well It is well With my soul It is well with my soul. It is I'm oh. 
With my soul It is well It is well With my soul 